so we have covered past oil demand and the many interacting forces that are driving it. But the question of this chapter is, what will the future demand of oil be? If we follow current trends, the answer will undoubtedly be a lot more. But it could be less if we enter a period of economic volatility, and if we finally decide to get serious about climate change, the answer will be a lot less again. So there is a very big question mark on what will happen because of this large range of possible futures. There are many organisations that make it their business predicting future oil demand. The main voices are the Energy Information Administration, or EIA, which is a wing of the US Department of Energy, and the International Energy Agency, or IEA, which is an independent intergovernmental organisation funded through the 28 member countries of the OECD. Both of these agencies are the main sources of information which governments use to inform energy policy. A technical note before we begin. When I say oil demand, I really mean liquid fuel demand. Historically, they have pretty much meant the same thing. But recently, with the growth of non-conventional liquids, such as biofuels and oil sands, this link has been blurred. Not all organisations are consistent with how they include the various liquid fuel sources. But all the numbers you will see in this chapter will represent total liquid fuel demand. If we take a look at some of the past projections since 1995, you might be excused for thinking a shotgun went off in a prison. But it highlights the fact that predicting the future with accuracy is always a near impossible task, due to the many interacting forces we covered in the last chapter. To be fair, both the IEA and EIA make it clear that what they publish in their annual Energy Outlook publications are not predictions but rather scenarios based on particular assumptions about GDP, oil price, and oil intensity. If we vary the growth rates of GDP, we can see the range of possible futures and why some of these past projections have been so off. Doing this same sensitivity analysis for oil intensity yields similar results. And if we model the same numbers together, we get an even bigger range. This demonstrates that projections are highly sensitive to these base assumptions. As assumption is the mother of all screw-ups, we need to understand projections for what they really are. A slightly informed, rough guess. Or, in the words of Philip Verlager, energy models are the most expensive, most cumbersome random number generators ever invented. And looking at some of the results over the last 15 years, you would have to agree. But as the BP website points out, developing numerical projections sharpens our thinking and enables us to appreciate the underlying story of the challenges and choices we have regarding energy. Despite all the noise, there are actually some universal patterns amongst these different projections and if we go through the various organisations one by one, they will become more apparent. The US Energy Information Administration bases its reference scenario in its International Energy Outlook publications on established trends and projects them forward. Also presented are alternative scenarios which are based on higher and lower assumptions for economic growth or oil price. This approach works well in periods of stability, but it is not good at predicting changes in energy markets. Given the recent volatility in oil prices, the uncertainty surrounding economic growth, and the policy response to climate change, one has to question just how useful these business as usual style projections really are. The International Energy Agency, through its flagship report, The World Energy Outlook, have traditionally projected oil demand in a similar way by extrapolating current government policies into the future. 
But over the last 12 years, the reports have become increasingly vocal on the dangers of climate change, which has resulted in the last five years having multiple scenarios which today reflect the trajectory of current policies, announce new policies, and what is needed to meet a carbon target of 450 parts per million. The last few years have seen the new policy scenario being promoted as the centrepiece projection in these reports. The IEA also gives out shorter five-year projections through its oil market report publications that slightly contradict their longer-term scenarios. Overall, it seems to indicate that oil demand will be high in the short term, tracking on or above the current policy scenario, and growth will later slow, approaching the new policy scenario once government climate policies kick in. The growing concern over the last few years of the ability of supply being able to meet this demand has resulted in a new deferred investment scenario being included in the 2011 report. And it highlights graphically for the first time that the historic assumption that supply will automatically be able to match demand may indeed be false. OPEC, the Organisation of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, started releasing their World Oil Outlook reports in 2007. They follow a similar current policies trend approach, but have been more consistent from year to year than both the EIA and the IEA. Along with higher and lower economic growth scenarios, they have recently included an accelerated transportation technology and policy scenario to reflect the potential policy changes due to energy security and climate change concerns. But the comments in this section of the report indicate they are more worried about security of demand and the associated risks of their oil investment plans than anything else. But all three of these are political documents to some degree, whose messaging cannot be too controversial. Other commentators don't have the same measure of responsibility and as such have more freedom to make predictions about the future without the same consequences of getting it wrong. The methodology behind ExxonMobil's The Outlook for Energy reports is unclear, but it closely echoes the other business as usual projections. What they do make clear is that much of this future demand will come from growth in commercial transportation. BP in their last two years have released their projections which are not based on business as usual or policy trends, but rather their best guess on the likely outcome given today's state of play. To take account for the likely response to climate change, they have also included a projection showing what aggressive policies will likely achieve. Perhaps fuelled by the 2008 price shock, Deutsche Bank has since argued that non-OPEC oil production is close to peaking increasing the reliance on OPEC, who are already locked in an underinvestment cycle. The result will be higher oil prices and extreme volatility that will simultaneously increase underinvestment in oil supply and break consumer demand as it did in 2008. They believe that high oil prices and not geology will trigger the gradual end to the age of oil, with demand levelling out over the next decade. Shell, in its Energy Scenarios to 2050 publications, sees the future being characterised by the enormous challenge of more energy, less carbon dioxide. They also predict that traditional energy supplies will be unable to keep up with the underlying demand, and so we will soon enter an era of volatile transitions. They see the future unfolding somewhere between two different paths. In the scramble scenario, the status quo is maintained until energy shortages cause significant economic volatility. Governments will focus on energy supply and maintaining economic growth, largely ignoring the politically unpopular demand reduction approach until economic and environmental stresses stimulate a too little, too late response. 
In the blueprint scenario, governments, businesses and people see the mutual benefit in taking action before being forced by circumstance. A high degree of local and international collaboration sees the focus on reducing energy demand and policies that allow a smoother and more rapid transition to renewable energy sources. A number of executives from the French oil giant Total have publicly stated that there will be a lack of sufficient energy available and that it will be difficult to produce more than 95 to 97 million barrels per day in the foreseeable future. Their 2010 annual report states, Easy oil and gas is definitely a thing of the past. The technological, geopolitical and environmental challenges we face are enormous. So there you have it, a brief summary of all the different organisations and their estimates of how much oil will be needed by 2030. Taking the average, you would expect around 105 million barrels of oil per day. But given the inherent uncertainty in any long-term projection, especially given the volatility of recent years, this is more likely wrong than right. Besides, the point to all of these numbers was to sharpen our thinking so that we can begin to understand the story driving oil consumption and ultimately the story of human prosperity. If we are to properly understand this story and the direction it will head, we need to have a feel for the key elements in this narrative and the impact they can have on the final number. To do that, we need to spend some time examining the similarities and differences in these projections. That is what we'll be doing on the next stop in this journey. I do hope you'll join me.